we are so glad to have you here. I will say first, my name is Anna Ellis. I'm the president and CEO of New Memphis. If you um, are not familiar with New Memphis, come talk to me. <laughs> so I won't go into all of the um, all of the background, but I, I want to just first say that we've been doing this luncheon series for nearly 15 years, which is sort of astounding to think about. And um, you know, we've the team, the New Memphis team, has really persisted throughout this pandemic, um, just knowing that. Now more than ever, we need to embrace what is going well in our city, what we can authentically celebrate, and that's what this luncheon series is all about. It is about making sure that every leader in our city has access to the knowledge um, that you guys are aware of these amazing leaders, some of which you're going to hear from today, um, who are making change in our city and making sure that we're building a brighter future for our city. So that's why we do this. Um, we've actually, you know, as we've been doing these events virtually, it's been, um, you know, one step forward, one step back. One of the great benefits has been to see new people come and join us um, virtually at a luncheon, to see people from um, different corners of our city who may never have joined us in person. So, um, you know, I'm so glad that you guys virtually are joining us today. Thank you. I hope that you continue to do that. Silver lining of um, this great experiment is that I think we will always make sure that this information is available to anyone who wants to log in over lunch and hear an inspiring conversation from some of our city's best leaders. So um, again, I'm very happy to have you guys joining us. I'm gonna get to some of our housekeeping. Um, if you are not aware, this we, we always pick a different topic, a different theme for these luncheons, where we do a deep dive into, again, something that we're, as the name implies, ready to celebrate. So today we're gonna take a look at youth and the arts. So this intersection is one, um, and this is why, this is one of the fun parts about being on the New Memphis team. You get to sort of look around the community and go, what is like very exciting to me? And um, over the last year, we were looking at our arts organizations who are doing really innovative things with our community's youth, both to help them learn new skills, to develop as people, to be confident, to have mental health, to learn about new issues, in addition to just exploring an artistic field. So um, we have a couple of those organizations represented today. I know they're going to talk about the entire landscape of incredible arts organizations in our community and how they are making sure that our youth have a brighter future. So before we get to that, um, a few housekeeping items. Um, so again, first to our virtual audience, throughout the event, we encourage you to use the chat as a great resource. Um, as other participants chime in, we would love, again, for you guys to interact with us. We do have folks on the New Memphis team looking at that, and uh, we're, you know, both half virtual and half in person as well. Um, for those of you who are here in person, when you exit, you will see a pop-up survey, um, and I please ask, you'll see it up here, I believe, and there's also um, some QR codes on your seat. We desperately love to get feedback. Um, I always say that we <laughs> we ask people to fill out surveys all the time, and I know it feels arduous, but it does really help us inform our work. So if you have ideas for future topics, we love to hear that too. Um, and then again, for our in-person guests, please do um, grab a lunch on your way out. Again, we're doing things a little bit differently, so we're not all just um, banging forks and knives around and eating together today, but hopefully soon. But please do take a lunch to go. Um, we're happy to have you here, and we want you to be nourished. Um, and then finally, I would be remiss if I didn't start by saying, again, that this event would not be possible without our generous sponsors and friends. Um, as I mentioned, we've been doing this event for nearly 15 years, and in that time, the First Horizon Foundation has been a partner from day one. Um, they have made this work possible. They've really helped vision alongside us to say, what, you know, what do we want to celebrate? Um, they're so such authentic partners. Um, I will also like to, I would also like to thank Blue Cross Blue Shield of Tennessee. Um, they have also been longtime partners of New Memphis. They believe deeply in this work. They understand why we do this work. We're thrilled to have Kevin Woods here today, who's both a New Memphis trustee and also a leader at Blue Cross Blue Shield. Um, and then finally, Bassberry Sims, um, again, a fantastic local law firm who has um, just given tremendous support. So thank you, thank you to all of you. Um, I will also mention that before we finish today, we are going to do one of my favorite Favorite things that we do every year, which is honor our educators of excellence. Um, where are y'all? Um, every year, New Memphis, because of generous funding from the Cruz Family Foundation, is able to give a cash reward to the teachers in our community who are excellent, who are delivering um, amazing insights to our kids. Um, I, I, I love reading their stories every year and just understanding who you are, what brought you to education, what brought you to Memphis, and why you continue to do the very important work that you do. So thank you. Um, all right, so I'm going to welcome um, Rob Hurd. He's the Mid-South Region's Director of Private Client Financial Services, such a mouthful, Rob, um, at First Horizon. 
And he's also on the Brooks Museum um, board. So this is, I didn't realize that, but what a wonderful um, coincidence. So come on up and we'll get started. Hello, as she said, I'm Rob Hurd. I'm the Mid-South Region's Director of Private Client Financial Services for First Horizon Bank. And I also have the pleasure of serving on the Brooks Museum Board. On behalf of the First Horizon Foundation, I'd like to personally welcome you to today's Celebrate What's Right Luncheon. The events of the past year have truly highlighted what we should all take time to celebrate what's right. I'm excited to be here with you today and celebrate and highlight our city's arts and community. First Horizon is a proud supporter and partner of New Memphis and many other nonprofits that are actively working to make Memphis a better place. Today, we have the opportunity to highlight the work of several arts not nonprofit organizations. So I'll begin by introducing our panel to moderator, Tracy Loritson Wright. Tracy is the Chief Operating Officer at Arts Memphis, a local arts agency and a First Horizon partner, a First Horizon Foundation partner. With a 58 year history of sustaining Memphis's world renowned cultural vitality. As Chief Operating Officer, Tracy is responsible for the administration of approximately 3 million in grants to approximately 70 arts organizations and artists annually. She has more than 25 years experience working in museums and cultural organizations. Her past service includes 14 years at the National Civil Rights Museum, working in a variety of capacities, most notably as the project manager for the $27.5 million renovation of the museum's permanent exhibits that was completed in 2014. In addition, she served as the executive director of Delta Access, a contemporary art and film organization, was the founding board member of the Indy Memphis Film Festival, and is a former board member of the board of directors of the Tennessee Association of Museums. Her current focus is on strengthening local communities through the arts by expanding Arts Memphis's support to more artists and organizations and connecting community partners with arts organizations. A native of Nebraska, she holds an MA in Museum Studies from the University of Nebraska, but has now been a proud Memphian for 21 years. Please join me in welcoming Tracy to the stage. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, I was telling Rob I had forgotten how long that bio was. I apologize for that. <laughs> but um, good afternoon. It's great to see you all. Thank you so much for joining us for this conversation today. On behalf of the local arts sector, we also would like to thank First Horizon Foundation for their generous support of the arts in Memphis for decades. We've been a partner with the First Horizon Foundation for the last 10 years to administer their local arts giving, and they truly are committed to the sex success of the arts sector. So thank you, Rob, and for the whole team at First Horizon Foundation. But um, on behalf of Arts Memphis and, and our board chair, Kathy Gail Yulhorn, who's here in the audience, and our vice chair, Russ Wigginton, as well, we want to thank you all for being part of this very important conversation today. Arts Memphis is a nonprofit serving as the local arts agency since 1963, as Rob mentioned. Since that time, we've invested $87 million in the arts sector, thanks to the generosity of our community. Last year, we provided $2.2 million in support and also served as a convener and connector to 64 different arts organizations and hundreds of artists um, working in all disciplines. And we also uh, have the honor of working with all of our panelists here today, not just as grantees, but as partners in sustaining Memphis's world-renowned cultural vitality and strengthening local communities through the arts. And these folks represent just a few of our community's contributors who are working to expand the foundation for the arts in Memphis. 
And um, as, as we've heard, this is our first hybrid Celebrate What's Right discussion. So we're grateful to be here together, to be with everyone in the audience, and to have everyone here who's joining us virtually from your home or from your office. Thank you for joining us. Um, of course, we're in this hybrid model because we are still navigating the pandemic, which has hit our art sector particularly hard. Um, our local arts community worked tirelessly last year to innovate, to create, and to continue to provide arts experiences that allowed us to connect and brought communities together despite our separation. Um, yet despite all of that hard work, nonprofit arts organizations experienced a 53% reduction in staff, a collective $24 million reduction in revenue, which would have been much higher were it not for the federal relief programs. And we also saw a 61% reduction in youth arts participation last year. Um, so there are many reasons why we should be concerned about that and why um, we should all be invested in the recovery of our arts sector. We know that the arts are big business in Shelby County. Pre-pandemic, the nonprofit's arts sector pumped about $200 million annually into our local economy, sustained more than 6,000 jobs, and drove about $22 million in tax revenue to state and local governments. Um, and we also know that the arts are vital to a vibrant and thriving city that att attracts and retains talented and committed people who work together to make our city even better. And it is also that arts legacy that drives tourism to Memphis. So I think all of us have probably said at one point or another, if you're bored in Memphis, you really aren't trying at all. <laughs> we have an abundance of really high quality arts experiences and organizations that serve every single zip code in this county. But today we're here to talk about our youngest arts audiences and the critically important benefits that come from having a high quality arts access at a young age. Um, and in Memphis, due to our devastatingly high youth poverty rate, we always need to talk about what we can do to move people out of poverty and until then work to alleviate the trauma of poverty and the arts are a critical element in that effort. Um, we all know, and I know personally from my daughter's experience in dance and theater and music instruction, that arts education and creative youth development help children develop important life skills, collaboration, empathy, discipline, time management, goal setting, and of course, creativity. Um, for some people, there might be a perception that a STEM education is more focus focused on job preparation, but um, a 2020 LinkedIn report noted that the most desired soft skills, number one, creativity, collaboration, persuasion, adaptability, and emotional intelligence. And those are skills that you can more readily get through an arts education probably through a STEM education. So there is a lot of evidence about how creative youth development programs benefit youth, extracurricular arts access in particular, and that's part of what we're gonna focus on in our conversations today. And especially when you look at students in low uh, socioeconomic brackets, high access to art is critical and can be make a dramatic difference in, um, a variety of areas into adulthood from positively impacting school grades, test scores, high school graduation rates, college enrollment and graduation rates, professional career pursuits, and civic engagement. And so this important work of providing creative youth development and arts access is happening all across our city. Today we have four amazing leaders in our local arts community to talk about the important work that they're doing right in our community to provide Memphis youth um, with the, the important skills that they'll need for the rest of their lives. And um, so I know today, once we get talking here, that you all are going to be really impressed with the work that these folks are doing. Um, and they're just four examples of some great work happening in Memphis. And I think we all should be very excited and very proud about the state of the arts in Memphis. We have a lot of exciting developments on the horizon. We have some amazing accomplishments behind us. And the arts are definitely part of what is right in Memphis. So thank you all for being here. So I think now we'll um, get on to introductions and we'll ask each panelist to introduce yourself, your organization and your work briefly. And if you could tell us um, in one word, what the arts mean to the future of our city.
Hi. Thank you so much for having me. It's really a pleasure. I'm Karen Nicely. I am with Collage Dance Collective. We are, we just uh, built a new building. We were on Broad Avenue for several years, about eight years, and we just recently opened up our new building on Sam Cooper and Tillman. So that studio now has five studios uh, in comparison to our first building, which had two studios. So we are really excited about the development that we have just achieved there. Uh, my role there, which is new, I just moved here to Memphis, Tennessee, uh, three months ago from New York City. And so I've been in art, arts education and integration for about 20 years. So it's really an honor, pleasure to be here. I've been affiliated with Collage since its founding about 14 years ago, and my role is now community engagement manager. And I would say my word immediately uh, at the top of my head for what we are striving for is expansion. Oh, wait, I think I got it. Okay. There we go. Woo! Better have the middle seat. <laughs> okay, I'm Virginia Murphy, Virginia Reed Murphy. I'm the founder and director of Playback Memphis, and I'm really honored to be here. I want to thank Arts Memphis and New Memphis. I love the idea of celebrating what's right, and especially um, thinking about the youth and arts and the power of that. So for those of you who may not be familiar with Playback Memphis, um, at our core, we are an improvisational performance ensemble um, made up of actors and dancers, musicians and poets. And at um, our performances, people share true stories from their lives uh, and we bring those to life on the spot. And we do this in the service of building empathy uh, and creating a space for reflection, giving ourselves a space to pause and be reflective about our lives. Obviously, right now, <laughs> there's a lot that we're all holding and navigating in being human. And uh, so we do this through public performances and we also engage um, across sectors, having programs um, in schools and actually work with law enforcement uh, and uh, with a number of nonprofits. And so we're grateful to be able to have our practice of playback theater um, at such a time as this, um, as it helps us to stay connected to our humanity. So thank you and I'll pass it to you, Lawrence. Turn my mic off. Good afternoon. Uh, my name is Lawrence Blackwell. I am the director of In Schools at Memphis Music Initiative. Uh, Memphis Music Initiative, uh, our core work is investing in youth through transformative music to create equitable opportunities for black and brown youth. Now, what that really means for us is we are a three component organization to create wraparound services for youth. We have in schools, which I'll talk about in a second. We have what's called MMI Works, Memphis Music Initiative Works, where we actually hire uh, students uh, for summer employment and internships. And then we have another component called grant making and capacity. And they work with local nonprofits uh, serving black and brown youth to strengthen or grow their organizations. Uh, in schools, what we do is we actually hire professional musicians to go into the classroom to work with the teachers or to be the lead teacher at uh, music classrooms over the course of the year. Uh, for the past seven years, we have invested $9 million in that endeavor, hiring fellows and taking students on field trips, whether that's uh, to New York, New Orleans, and allowing these students to have uh, performances and exposures to different um, types of environments. Excuse me. Uh, what we are prideful of is our new pivot, and that is our work with creative liberation. We make no qualms about the fact that we are music skill building educators. We are helping these students uh, learn these music skills, whether it's in music production, orchestra, choir, band, uh, jazz, piano. 
we work with them on those music skills, but we also come at it from a cultural liberation model. And that is where we are truly trying to expose these youth to um, their own uh, culture, making them aware of other cultures so that they have interpersonal relationships uh, with different communities, whether that's uh, here in Memphis or outside. And that's Memphis Music Initiative. My one word is growth. Mine is hope. Okay, that was enough time for me to turn my microphone on. Um, hi, I'm Megan Benazic. I'm the executive director at the Carpenter Art Garden. Um, the Art Garden is a nonprofit in Binghampton working with students to develop their creative potential through artistic, educational, and vocational programs. Um, if any of y'all have ever been to the Art Garden before, it's oh, that doesn't really do it justice. You have to go there and, and see it. Um, we say children, but our programs range anywhere from opportunities to bring your toddlers up there to uh, adult art classes during the school day. So, um, and through that, we're directly on Carpenter Street on the east side of Binghampton. We have a unique campus and we've been lucky enough to partner actually with all of these organizations in our past decade, whether it was a Memphis Music Initiative instructor leading a drumming class or Playback Memphis has performed on our stage and we've done dance classes as well with collage. So we're lucky we have a lot of people come through our space uh, to lead different programs right there on Carpenter Street. Oh, in my word, connection. Wonderful, thank you. All right, so now we're going to um, ask each organization a few uh, questions. And Karen, we'll start with you because this topic today actually grew out of a discussion with the New Memphis people and uh, Collage co-founders, Marcellus Harper and Kevin Thomas. So um, wondering if you can talk, one, about what, what your word expansion means for Collage and how you were working to ensure that every generation have, has access to the arts, especially dance arts, of course. Um, and then could you also talk about the importance of representation for collage and, and your art form? Sure, wonderful. Well, as far as the word expand, and thank you, and the reason why that comes to my mind immediately is the mission of Collage Dance Collective is to really bring diversity to the world of ballet. So historically that hasn't existed. And so that uh, affects audiences, communities, you know, those who don't have the resources or the means or the funding to be able to receive that private training. And because of history also has not been able to maybe have a role model in front of them to be able to see that hope, that future. So when I was a young ballet dancer, it was dance out of Harlem. But the only ballet school that I really was able to see, maybe I do have a future in classical ballet, which had become a passion into my teens. So we want to change that. We want to change that course. We need more examples. We need more. Um, we want to be the seed that really plants and grows this expanding tree of hope for young learners to you know, may not mean to necessarily have a career in ballet or dance, but to really be able to achieve their highest dreams. And that comes from uh, setting an example, inspiring them. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Um, we'll just go down the line, Virginia, um, if you don't mind. So, so playback is not only providing theatrical outlets for youth, but you're using theater to facilitate conversations around sensitive topics and also using it as a tool for peace building. So, um, so also, could you talk about what, why hope is your word um, and then talk about your Be the Peace program, how that got started, and maybe talk also about your work on the Performing the Peace um, program, if, if uh, both of those, if you could please. Sure. Um, <laughs> uh, hope. I chose hope because I think when we're faced with enormous challenges, that if we if we can't find hope, then it's hard to take an action 
to move forward. And so I think that the arts, I think that there are, um, the arts allow us to move from only this into a, a more integrated embodied sense of our humanity. And I think that um, to do that uh, gives us hope. So Playback Memphis, um, our Be the Peace work is, um, is our school-based work and it has two tracks to it. So we have uh, an anti-bullying program um, that we offered in partnership with um, Le Bonner Community Outreach Program and delivered um, to uh, schools um, pre-pandemic. Um, uh, and during this program, um, sorry, y'all, I'm a little bit nervous and I have not been out and I'm noticing that. So I'm just going to name that because that's what Playback teaches me to do, to be aware when I'm not in the flow. And so... And you're, you're the expert on Playback. I am. Room, so. And I'm going to take a deep breath right now. I'm going to ask y'all to do that with me, even like out there in virtual land. And I'm going to kind of restart. It's my first in-person engagement. Okay. <laughs> So, uh, so be the peace. Our anti-bullying program. Uh, what we um, what we do in this is we use playback. We combine it with some role play to go into schools and to deliver some really important messaging around um, around what bullying is and what it's not, and um, what you can do as a student if you see someone being bullied that's helpful and what's not helpful and uh, we give the students the opportunity to be able to reflect on the impact of bullying and um and and to see that um and feel that in a way uh when we are performing that back the, that gives that a um, them a connection to that lived experience that just hits home and then we give them the opportunity to practice in a role play um what they might do if they see someone being bullied and um and so this is one example of how we apply playback um, in the schools and another is um generally going into the schools we've had a partnership with schools in Fraser, where we use playback theater as a tool to um, build positive school culture to strengthen social emotional learning um, to introduce trauma-informed awareness and care and this work grew out of a program that we have called performing the peace which brings together um, formerly incarcerated individuals who, or and individuals who have been impacted by the criminal justice system we've partnered with Lifeline to Success in the past in Fraser and also Dr. Benjamin Hook's Job Corps. And, um, and this schoolwork actually grew out of the vision of the individuals who participated in this program who felt like that they had, um, if they had been introduced to this work um, early in their lives, that it could have made the difference. So we use playback as a way to teach skills of mindful listening, um, to help people grow their awareness. Um, and then we also deliver this work to new recruits at the Memphis Police Academy, um, also to teach cultural humility and empathic listening. So. Thank you so much. All right, Lawrence, we'll move move down to you. Um, so Memphis Music Initiative invests in youth development through transformative music engagement. So I'd love it if you could please talk about your word growth, and if you could also talk about the importance in Memphis of providing high quality music education. Okay. Um, I chose growth um, because I was stuck to confined to one word. Um, when I think about growth, I think about my fifth grader and seventh grader and how they grow and where they move from their individual ideas to a community, a communal idea. And that's what I see arts able to do for our city. Um, the art is a, not only a self-expression, but it's a communal expression. It's a reflection of things that are going on in your community. 
the more we can invest in the arts, the more expression we have, the more interconnectedness and understanding we have, and the more we can grow locally in individual communities. And then those communities can start to react to other communities here in Memphis, and we can grow through that way. So that's what I think about in growth, moving from that adolescent stage of me, me, me to we, we, we. Um, the second part of that question was the impact of... Um, the importance of high quality music education uh, in Memphis specifically. That's a huge thing to unpack. Uh, what we have in Memphis is a dearth of resources in the school systems for music education specifically. Uh, some programs have abundance, they have instruments, they may have um, two teachers. In the majority of our schools in Memphis, what's not realized is one music teacher may be serving five schools in a week. That lack of resource, that lack of having a teacher in the school all day long for these students to go to, to have as a mentor, uh, really affects their ability to connect with the art. So what we are looking at with Memphis Music Initiative, we place our fellows in the school uh, five hours a day uh, so that these students actually have um, a music teacher there that they can go to on their break or uh, work with. The importance behind the high quality education, uh, music education is simply the idea that we have liberation. As an artist, your creation is yours. Whether it's uh, an economic benefit, whether it's an emotional benefit, you are now able to liberate something of yourself and find your own way or find a path for yourself, start to find that path for yourself. So this high quality music education, again, whether it's an orchestra, band, choir, music production, gives these students um, at least a leg to stand on to start that path uh, to find their self-identity. Thank you. Thank you. All right, Megan, I neglected to write down your word. So I'm sorry about that. Connection. <laughs> it's connection. Thank you. <laughs> All right. So um, Carpenter Art Garden, um, your mission and vision um, are you know working with the children of Binghampton to promote each one's creativity, self-worth through exposure to artistic, educational, and vocational programs. So, so thinking about that and your word connection, um, could you talk a little bit about how the Carpenter Art Garden campus was formed and grew and developed and what, what that location means to your neighbors and that neighborhood? Yeah, so when I chose Connection, it's specifically tied to my experience in the arts at the Art Garden. Um, if you've been there before, it's a blank canvas. There's been thousands of hands and thousands of ideas that have contributed to the spaces um, from murals to a mosaic garden to physical vegetable gardens. Um, there's a lot of different hands, a lot of different ideas that build up the space over the past uh, 10 years. Um, and for kids in making that, um, that connection to the neighborhood, um, we're often approached about community building and how that ties into our work. And when we talk about it as a staff, it's more being neighborly, being good neighbors. Um, and these children who are putting together these ideas, executing with community members, and they're able to then show these large scale projects, these permanent installations. And there's that sense of pride and connection in this coming to life in a place where their mother is walking by and seeing it, their teacher is walking by and seeing it, and having that connection to share, where did this come from? What inspired this? How did you put this together? And we've, through the past 10 years in different pockets on the street, been able to um, collaborate and work with people to bring together maybe people who wouldn't otherwise have connected or have found a common ground. Um, but the arts we have found have been really powerful in doing that uh, with, with anybody that's walking down the street. Thank you. 
Um, so now I, I'd like um, each of you, if you can, to maybe share an example of the impact of your programs for youth. Um, you know, if you have a particular, you know, success story or if you have, you know, specific data that you'd like to share or, you know, maybe how your programs have helped students, those that you maybe have seen long term as, you know, grow out of your programs into adulthood. Um, and I know, Virginia, you said you have a story for that that you wanted to share. So maybe we'll start with you. So uh, my story uh, comes from the early stages of us offering Be the Peace um, in a school in Frazier. And one of the things that we're doing when we're teaching the practice of playback is we're using it as a medium to also share the principles and practices um, of nonviolent communication. And uh, so this particular <laughs> class of fifth graders, this is the grade that we engage, um, there's a pretty big, pretty high level of resistance to our work initially um, because most of these kids have not had any exposure or access to the arts. They're also, um, you know, we're outsiders, and so there's there's trust issue there, and um, and so uh, uh, we um, introduce um, what we call um, I statement role plays, and in I statement role plays. Um, we're basically sort of teaching this idea that all conflict um, emerges out of some real human need. Um, so the strategy that one might go about to get their needs met may be harmful, and there's no argument there, but that if when conflict or tension emerges, if we develop the capacity to be aware um, of how we're feeling and what we need and be able to pay attention and stay connected to what the other person in front of us is feeling and needs, there's a likelihood that we're going to be able to hold the person's humanity and solve the conflict peacefully versus slipping into uh, reactivity, which we're all prone to do. I mean, raise your hand if you feel like that that happens to you, where you something arises and before you know it, you're getting tangled up in a story and here we are just, um, yeah, we know where we are, right? We're in 2021. <laughs> so, um, so, there's a, so on this particular occasion, we do this role play, um, give the kids get in there, and, and this is hard for adults even to um, to think of how you're going to put this in practice. The next time a conflict arises or a tension arises, we want you to pause and and really think, be aware of how you're feeling in your body and how the other piece, what might happen. So we do the role play and we're not entirely sure at all that this is connecting because it's hard for us as grown-ups. And, you know, we send the kids away and they're thinking, okay, did that click? Is there, you know... And the next week we come back and these two boys, um, Patrick and Cedric, they, they arrive. And when I say like they had their grins, if they were like hot air balloons, we all could have flown to you know, New Mexico on those. They were so happy and excited. We said, so what, what, what is this about? Because they're not typically arriving with these smiles. And they um, reveal that something had happened. Um, one of them had, had stepped on the other's backpack. And it was a moment where it could have turned into um, a big conflict and fight, but that they were able to apply, you know, what they had learned in the practice of, of, of playback in listening and paying attention and expressing their feelings in a way um, in which they were heard. And, and this just gave them um, it was like they had they had some magic elixir, like, oh wow, we can, you know, we can keep using this. And of course, you know, this this it, it's not a magic elixir, clearly. Um, but yeah, so those those moments happen a lot, those moments of awareness. And and I think for me, seeing how um, 
how students can take what they're learning and apply in their lives immediately to build healthy relationships um, is so encouraging and so gratifying. So, All right. Um, anyone have a story to build on Virginia's that you'd like to share? Two, go for it. Y'all can just leave them on. Yeah. <laughs> We're hopefully going to be talking a lot. <laughs> um, so my first story, I've only been with uh, Memphis Music Initiative for a little over a year. Unfortunately, I came in uh, in a pandemic year. So I was unable to see the students face to face. Um, my experiences with our youth have predominantly been on Zoom over the past year. Uh, but I have two stories from that. Uh, the first Working with middle school students, as I said earlier, a lot of our schools are under-resourced. And one school in particular, we were in a um, school that we were teaching music production. The school did not have any music production equipment, no computers, no uh, keyboards, nothing. The middle school students took it upon themselves to find phones. And with their um, fellow, they were able to create jingles and after about six months, they sold seven of those jingles. Oh. That didn't stop there. Then they were excited about, oh, we can do this. We can make money through art. <laughs> How do I make money? How do I count my money? And the next thing we know, they're interested in math. So the math teacher is coming back to us telling us, I don't know what you did in the music class, but <laughs> our students are excited about the math. So that's one success story, how uh, art is integrated in the school uh, and should be interdisciplinary with all the subjects in school. The second uh, story is um, last year we hosted our very first um, HBCU audition fair virtually. I'm proud to say that we had 100% uh, of our students that auditioned receive scholarships, but yeah. But the impressive part is about a third of those students had no dream of going to college. They believed at the beginning of the year that college was for um, different career paths. They did not understand that you could go to college for music. And when we started working with these students, uh, doing workshops, audition preps, they were like, oh, wait, this is a different pathway than the traditional idea of college. So out of those uh, students that receive scholarships, uh, good number of them had never dreamed of college until they um, followed the path of music. So those are my two. Thank you, Lawrence. You look like you had something to share too, Karen. I would love to. Yeah. I, I thank you all. These, these stories are really fantastic. I don't have a specific story because we have so many. And I really wanted to um, pinpoint on our young male dancers and the history of, of where we are now with them, which is so profound. So many years ago when uh, Marcellus Harper and Kevin Thomas first uh, arrived in Memphis and they had a small school in a church, so it was just starting off, as, as it usually, you know, goes is that you don't see as many males as you do females in ballet. So, their uh, mission as to, you know, grow their student body, and they did not have, again, as usual, you know, as many males, they really had a focus on providing ballet training and a program for young males of color. Already, that is a struggle that um, not everyone can truly understand, and especially if you're coming from a low-income community, and from that, that usually brings about um, behaviors and challenges. So through the discipline of ballet, one by one, the young male dancers that started to, that they started to work with in our outreach program, which I can talk about a little later, maybe our turning point program, um, they were able to start fostering you know, growth and development with those young men. And so in the beginning, it may not have been, you know, walking through the door, hey, I want to be a ballet dancer. It took a lot of work. And our artistic director, Kevin Thomas, 
he being a brown male dancer throughout his career, you know, in his life, and going through those struggles himself, he was able to bring, you know, what his lessons were through his career to these young men who uh, now, some of them have gone on to ballet schools in other states, and they're starting, we have a, one that actually is dancing on Broadway, we have a few that are really striving to go to college for dance, and they didn't necessarily, Marcellus and Kevin, I think, have it in their head, okay, they must become ballet dancers, but it was about through the study of ballet and what these young men were achieving and growing, you know, through. So that also created bonds, relationships, changing how they saw their future, and also changing how they saw relationships that may not have been um, existing in their life, you know, feeling that joy to see each other coming into the school every day. How high am I going to jump today? How are my legs going to stretch? And that's truly what collage, you know, really when I think about uh, this question and thank you for asking about victory stories and success, that is a huge one. And from just a few boys that they were training in the early years, that is now, I think we're over 30 young uh, male dancers and it continues to expand. I'll bring that word back. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Megan, do you have an yeah. impact story you'd like to share? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, so similarly, mine is not a specific story, but when I think of success at the art garden, it's definitely seen in the longevity of participation. Um, we have a lot of students who still participate in our programs that were there the first day 10 years ago when the art garden was founded. And through that, our programming has um, shifted and grown to meet their needs as they grow up. Um, and through that, we've developed a teen job program. Students have the opportunity, once they've aged into it and are ready for a little bit more responsibility to lead our art programs, lead our bike programs, lead our gardening programs. And this past summer, we had a teen staff of eight members in between the eight students. They had over 50 years experience at the art garden. Um, and specifically, I'm thinking this happened yesterday. Uh, we were sitting outside at the art garden and that's a drop in opportunity where anyone walking down the street can sit down and do a small group art project. And we have three teenagers who help lead those art programs. And they've had a lot of really amazing opportunities as children who first part participated in third and fourth grade to now they're working with the University of Memphis on developing a sculpture garden on, um, on Tillman, right by y'all at Collage. But she was talking about some of the sketching techniques that she'd been learning in her art two class in high school. And she has proposed the idea of uh, leading a sketching type of class at Tuesday Art Garden for younger students. And that's one example we've had a lot of different instances, whether it's a sculpture class, a drawing class, a painting class, we've seen these younger students who have grown up attending our programs, leading these for younger students. And to that same point, it might not be your career path to be an artist, but there's a ton of value in leadership and, and having those opportunities to execute your ideas and be supported and uh, offering learning experiences in a place where you feel safe and supported. So that's mine. Great. Thank you. Well, thinking about that and you know, also thinking about our topic today, looking at extracurricular arts access, maybe Megan, we can stay with you for a moment. Could you just talk about why having that after school program and summer programs, why that's important for the youth in your community? Yeah. Um, families. Yeah, so access, I think the Art Garden has shown again and again how much of a priority we make access for these programs. We're located on a school street where there um, is a housing development, but then also the elementary and middle school, and we're directly on that street. So when it comes to proximity and being in, in the community's mind, we're right there. Um, everything that is led at the art garden is led by Binghampton residents. Four of our staff actually live on Carpenter Street. And we are lucky and we have not had to 
charge anybody for any of our programs over the past decade. And that's anything from a violin lesson all the way to an art immersion trip to Chicago, Horn Island, St. Louis. And that's a really incredible thing that we can do being right there on the street. And through the years, we we have ideas for programs, but have been very flexible in what we decide to execute year to year. Um, summer programs specifically, instead of top down deciding what types of programs we're gonna do, it comes more from conversation and interest in deciding um, certain classes, certain artists that we're gonna have lead workshops based on what, what people who are walking down the street are asking and they wanna see led. Um, so I think the art garden really practice what we preach in terms of our staff all living on Carpenter Street, but then also being right there and being available to anybody interested. Um, Karen, do you want to talk about Turning Point? Sure, thank you. At Turning Point is our outreach program. And so that can include programming that's after school, extended day programming. It can also be in school. Right now, uh, since uh, August, we have we are now in six schools. Four are in Shelby County, and we are reaching a little over 230 students. So the conservatory alone is almost at 400. So uh, to us, that's pretty magnificent that at this time, we are Collage Dance Collective is providing ballet and dance training to almost 600 kids and reaching those families as well. The Turning Point program is a model and um, kind of paralleled with the conservatory curriculum. And we also require that all of our students wear the same uniform that the students in the conservatory would. So it's a big mission uh, of ours to continue to find um, or work towards funding so that we can really fund that and that whole look, that whole program, uh, those ideas. We're making it work right now and we're very happy about that, but we'd like to, to um, multiply this, you know, and reach 12 to 15 by June. So uh, the Turning Point program is really so special because we uh, reach the kids in the same way that we do the conservatory. We train them in the same way we expect the same. And uh, it's so imperative, it's crucial that there's extended and after school programming for the students and families that can afford to receive training in a private foundation, a private school. So that's really where our heart is, is uh, in this Turning Point program. And many of those, many of our students that have succeeded came from the Turning Point program years ago. So that is our uh, mission to also give scholarships to the students that we are training in Turning Point. Thank you. Anything else anyone wants to add on after school or summer programming? I know every summer I am always scrambling to find what are those arts camps opportunities for my daughter. So I know, you know, in after school too, it's, you know, um, I think for also for our community, to thrive, we have to have those opportunities for children to have those safe places after school and in the summer where they can continue to learn and grow while parents are at work. So um, I really appreciate the work y'all are doing. Yeah. Um, can I, can I yeah. share one thing? Go for it. Um, so we've had uh, a, a Be the Peace camp um, at Arc Wings in Fraser for uh, three years. And one of the things um, that I'm aware of in that experience is that our youth. Um, most of them don't have transportation. And so actually, you know, we do a lot to support them in getting to the camp. And uh, one of my favorite um, parts of it is the end when we have the experience. We've trained the youth in the art of playback theater and they perform with our professional ensemble and they get to invite their, um, their families. And I think that we can't, um, I can't overstate how um, valuable it is for youth to participate in the affirming, enriching experience of the arts with their families who don't have access to the arts. So that's something I appreciate and value. Well, I think um, I was looking around to see if we had any 
questions, but I'm not seeing anything from the, our friends in the back. Okay, so we're going to keep on keeping on. <laughs> um, so, oh, here comes Anna. All right. Well, we'll um, while we're getting to those questions, because we're going to wrap up in the next five minutes or so. Um, uh, okay. Why, why Memphis? Um, what is it about Memphis that gives us such a thriving arts scene? And we could be here talking about this for a long time, but briefly, <laughs> what do you all, why do you all think, um, what is it about Memphis? I'll, I'll start, I'm also not from Memphis, but I've been here. A, a good amount of time. And I was thinking about this when I was reading over these questions over the weekend. Everyone is so talented here. I feel like more so than anywhere else I've ever lived. Everyone is talented. It doesn't matter where you go, what you're going to go see. I am impressed every time I leave the house. <laughs> that's, that's why me Memphis. <laughs> I have to say, to, to answer your question, not long ago, I would have said, I don't know, you know, <laughs> I love New York, but it was, yes, I've been here every um, summer, you know, supporting Marcellus and Kevin with their summer uh, dance programs, hey, but during the pandemic, <laughs> during 2020 of the pandemic, I was visiting, uh, driving, you know, safe yeah. traveling, uh, <laughs> just told. to basically leave New York and get a break. Okay. from that and uh, they were under construction the building was under construction and by the end of uh 2020 around this time last year they had opened up for um a hybrid hybrid instruction and there was a special class that has been recently developed a level that um has our most technical skilled dancers where we can actually see okay you may have a pathway that's into a, a classical career. And uh, Kevin invited me in to take a look at the class and I was so moved um, to tears. I really saw the future. And it didn't take a lot for me at that moment. I'm just gonna pack my bags and come here and find out what Memphis is about because I see a lot happening here that I may have not seen or took for granted before. So I really, I'm so honored to be here in Memphis and learn even more about all of the art that's here. And I just want to add that we can't forget that the geographical location, so many people are coming to Memphis because it is a hub for art, uh, specifically music. Uh, here in the Mississippi Delta, we have people coming from New Orleans that may be on their way to Chicago or something, but stop here or in uh, Arkansas. So Memphis really is a unique area that is not only homegrown art, but is a, a beacon for other artists to come to and share. And and I can add that, you know, I, I think so much uh, beauty and power and creativity and possibility come can be mined from pain. And I think Memphis um, historically <laughs> sits on a river of pain. And I think the arts provide a healing salve, can provide a healing salve. And I think um, it, it creates the, the possibility for the kind of thriving art scene that we see. I agree, I think you're absolutely right. All right, well, we have, we have a question from the um, virtual audience through the chat. And um, so Megan had mentioned how at Carpenter Art Garden, they, uh, you know, take those conversations with youth to inform programming and decision making and, and new developments. Um, do you all have any other stories like Megan's on how you work with the youth to, to inform how you're working with them? Lawrence, you look like you're ready. Yeah, so um, as I said, we have our creative liberation uh, modules and we focus on Memphis black and brown artists. Uh, for example, one of our schools is focused strictly on Whitehaven. It's a school in Whitehaven and what they are studying is the history of Whitehaven music, the history of Whitehaven High School's involvement in music, the involvement of Elvis Presley to music, the, uh, and then finally the churches. And they're not only studying it from an anecdotal perspective, they're going to these places. They are creating artistic projects so that they are validating their own communities and helping bring that history back to their own communities. Uh, so that's one of the ways that we are working. Did you have something, Virginia? Well, I just want to give a, 
a plug to Bridges because we just did a youth adult equity workshop um, on Friday to explore how we can um, engage our youth um, in voices in shaping our programs more than we do. Um, so they do excellent work. <laughs> Thank you. Well, we have just a, a couple of minutes left. Um, and so I want to just close with, um, if you all could, you know, just share how you feel, you know, everyone in the room today in our virtual audience, how um, we all can help ensure that every child in Shelby County has access to high quality arts experiences and education. And um, before you all go, I'll just say um, there are arts events and experiences happening every day across Shelby County and at artsmemphis.org. We've got a comprehensive calendar. So if you're looking for something to do, you can go there and find out. And you can also look at um, uh, find links to all of these organizations, websites, and all of the other organizations that we're supporting. Um, so there's a lot of information there to help you discover how you can participate in the arts. But I'd love for you all to share your suggestion. Yeah, I think uh, coming and, you know, going out and seeing performances, uh, letting a family know that you, that you know may not uh, usually go out to a show, you know, let them know about it. Tell them to come out. Uh, and collage our new space. We have so much space for you to come on in and have an event and we'll support that and we'll have fun there. And, um, you know, and let's, let's, let's just really participate as much as possible and volunteer. I think volunteering is a really great part as much as possible with all arts organizations. And so, uh, in December, we're, we're having Light the Dream, a beautiful outdoor extravaganza with lights and performances. And so we hope uh, maybe you'll bring some friends along there. Um, I think that when you're in spaces and, and people are talking about how to solve complex problems or um, address issues in schools, ask how are the arts helping i think oftentimes we don't consider the ways in which the arts can really support us in um in meeting all kinds of of challenges and so that's one way and um and of course give generously to nonprofits who are <laughs> working yes indeed. in the arts and with youth and uh i'll pass it to lawrence on that um, my big thing is encouraging schools to look at process over product. Um, we are confined by strictures coming from Department of Education and art is truly an exploratory thing and it's personal and we need to be able to validate these young people's uh, expression instead of holding it to a standard that they may not care about. So just encouraging school systems to reimagine uh, what that process looks like. Uh, yeah, uh, pretty much what everyone else said. Uh, come, come to our art shows. We, um, we offer uh, several opportunities. I think that's an interesting um, aspect to art garden programs. We actually have opportunities to hang our artists' artwork up in professional galleries. Um, and speaking about the art garden what you learned today about all of these organizations i will echo you are always welcome to come by give me a call i would love to show you around and buy art from these artists support these artists Great, thank you. Well, um, again, thank you everyone who's here with us today and everyone joining us virtually. If you could please join, in me, join me in giving our panel a round of applause. Thank you all so much. Okay, I have the pleasure now of getting to introduce Kevin Woods with Blue Cross Blue, Cross Blue Shield of Tennessee. First. Okay, great. I got excited. Uh, How are you, right? Thank you. Well, you know, you stand in the way of lunch. You go ahead and try to get it get it over with, right? So, uh, um, again, uh, I'm Kevin Woods, uh, Memphis Market President for Blue Cross Blue Shield of Tennessee, as well as a new Memphis trustee. Uh, this event was celebrating what's right about Memphis, 
Uh, how about a round of applause for our audience? I mean, for our panelists and Tracy. <laughs> Truly change making leaders. Uh, and thank you for leading us through this thoughtful discussion. Um, Blue Cross has long enjoyed its relationship uh, with New Memphis Institute, an organization that's committed uh, to growing and retaining talent. Uh, I was surprised by the number of folks who are not from Memphis. And so obviously the work of New Memphis is vital to what we do. So shameless plug, Tina Moore, uh, one of our Blue Cross Blue Shield colleagues here from Denver, Colorado, we recruited her right before the pandemic. So obviously uh, retention and recruiting talent to Memphis is important to me. Uh, and I can continue to use lessons from New Memphis and their leadership because, you know, when you invite them out to a luncheon, you may want to tell her that we're not actually having lunch. Not, <laughs> not yet anyway. So, uh, so I think that's being taken care of. But again, a wonderful event. Uh, but in all seriousness, it's no secret that it takes a village to collaboratively support our young people. Uh, from the dance floor or, or art studios where our youth can transform into empathetic leaders of tomorrow to the classrooms where our youth learn academics and how to be part of a community. Uh, we know it takes leaders in every corner of our community to make that a possibility. Uh, New Memphis knows that educators are essential leaders in our community as their impact and investment is critical to our city's future success. In addition to our programming for educators, uh, New Memphis launched an Educators of Excellent Award in 2018 to recognize and celebrate the outstanding work of exceptional educators as valued members of our Memphis community. We always want to thank the Cruz Family Foundation for their generous support of this prestigious award, which includes a donation to each educator to support their efforts and making this year the best it can be. Pre-K through 12th grade full-time teachers, instructional staff, school and network administrators are all eligible for this award. Join us in celebrating the 2021 Educators of Excellence and welcome Aaron Wendell, New Memphis Senior Manager of Programs to present the awards for this year's Outstanding Educators. Thank you. Thank you so much to Kevin. And again, my name is Erin Wendell. Um, and it's such an honor to recognize these educators at New Memphis. I support both our educator and collegiate work. I'm very grateful to the Cruz Family Foundation um, who allows us to amplify the work of these amazing educators in our classrooms every day. So without further ado, our 2021 New Memphis Educators of Excellence. First up, we have champion for Memphis, Aaron Youngblood, geometry teacher at Martin Luther King College Prep High School. As we're recognizing these individuals, you can see a little bit about them on the screen as well. Next up, servant leader, Abigail Kovar, sixth grade special education teacher at Chickasaw Middle School. Student advocate Alexia Hernandez, eighth grade math teacher at Freedom Preparatory Academy Charter Schools. Future builder Kayla Jernigan, third grade lead teacher at Vision Preparatory Charter School. And inclusive educator Taylor Cow, director of student life at St. George's Independent School. Ladies and gentlemen, another round of applause for your 2021 Educators of Excellence. Be sure to tune in to the Meanwhile in Memphis podcast happening Tuesdays at 8 a.m. Uh, over the next two weeks, you'll get to hear more about these educator stories and the way that they're impacting youth here in our city. Um, so without further ado, again, uh, thank you so much on behalf of New Memphis for coming today, uh, whether virtually or in person. I'd also like to thank our sponsors, First Horizon Foundation, 
Bassberry Sims and Blue Cross Blue Shield of Tennessee. Let me just pull these notes up. My apologies, y'all. Um, for making today's event possible, as well as the Cruise Foundation, again, with our Educators of Excellence Award. I also thank you all for coming out to join us. Again, um, being with us for this first hybrid event or joining us virtually, uh, we appreciate you being here.